This is Democracy Watch. So, Mark, now that Donald Trump is a convicted felon and as we await his sentencing, which will happen on July 11th, there's been a lot of discussion about his voting rights. So I want to take on that issue. So first off, will Donald Trump be able to vote in the upcoming presidential election and will his ability to vote depend on whether he's sentenced to prison or probation, for example? Yeah. So here's the deal. Florida has very unforgiving laws, as you as you might imagine, yeah. uh, on this on this topic. And and the original reaction of of the of all the Republicans in Florida was essentially we'll move heaven and earth to make sure he can vote. But here's here's the way it works is Florida, when you are talking about an out of state conviction. So this is someone who has been convicted in this case in New York. They will look to say, well, what does New York state law say about this? And what New York state law says is that if he is incarcerated, then he can't vote. But if he's not incarcerated, he can. So it, to answer your question, it's going to very much depend on whether he is he is uh, sentenced to a period of incarceration and whether or not he is actually in in prison or jail at the time that the election is held. And are those rules steadfast or is that the recommendation that Florida officials can follow? So there is, again, a lot of confusion about this because there are people who who are experts in Florida law who immediately jump to the conclusion that, in fact, Florida can deny someone the right to vote, even if the forum state, in this case, New York, doesn't. But it's pretty clear the Republicans are not going to do that. Whether that is common or not, you know, I, I, I rather doubt. I suspect they usually do sort of do this. Well, what does the other state do? But it is clear that one way or another, Ron DeSantis and the Republican legislature is going to look, they'll change the law if they have to, to make sure that Donald Trump can vote because because they want one set of rules applying to him and a different set of rules applying to everybody else. Well, OK, to that point, then, if Donald Trump can exercise his right to vote and he's been found of, you know, found guilty of a felony conviction in another state, would other felons in a similar situation, other Florida re residing felons who'd been convicted in other states be able to point to a precedent established with Trump to have their voting rights restored? They can try. But, you know, as you and I both know, and as Democracy Docket has covered, the state of Florida has done backflips to prevent people from being able to vote if they have been convicted. In fact, you know, we saw a, scan a scandal in which, you know, Ron DeSantis created a special police force that essentially harassed people wrongly uh, uh, and, and, and in some cases arrested them for voting when Florida thought that they weren't allowed to. And it turns out that they were, they, the voters were in the right. These yeah. people were, were, were innocent, but, but, but have been intimidated. So part of the problem we have in Florida is not just a legal regime problem. In other words, are they allowed to or could they bring a claim? But we have faced the, the incredible circumstance in Florida where even when people are entitled to vote, when they do do all the steps necessary, we have seen Ron DeSantis, you know, basically act like a, an authoritarian thug in, in intimidating people not to exercise those rights. And so, for example, if that if that is the case, let's say you have a completely analogous situation where where, you know, let's take the state of New York. You have somebody who was convicted in New York, goes back to Florida, has been denied their right to vote in Florida. And this issue is basically, you know, for these other felons, this issue is appealed up to a very conservative Florida Supreme Court. Is that the and they rule against him, even if they allow Donald Trump to do the exact same thing? Is that something where that would be the end of the line? Because, you know, because this is a state's issue and the federal government wouldn't even be able to interfere. And so you can have two completely analogous situations with two completely opposite outcomes? Yeah, look, I think that's entirely possible. Uh, so yes, it is. But Brian, I think it misses in some sense what I think the grave danger is, is that if you are that person, okay, who has a conviction in New York and you live in Florida and you are not incarcerated, and therefore you believe you're, you're right, you are eligible to vote. Um, right now you are facing a governor with a proven history of engaging in absolutely outrageous tactics to, to threaten you, to yeah. harass you. So the question is, how many people won't vote who are in that circumstance, who are entitled to vote? How many people won't vote because, you know what, they have internalized the message that Republicans in Florida have sent them, which is that there's one set of rules for Donald Trump, but don't you dare try to follow those rules. Because even if you're 100% right, even if the judge agrees with you, you will have paid such a price 
in uh, at the hands of of Ron DeSantis and his ilk, that it's just not worth the the hassle. And that is one of the great catastrophes of democracy we face right now is that yeah. Republicans are targeting people to harass them and make it harder to vote. And a lot of people are saying, you know what? I don't need the trouble. I don't need to be in the middle of a controversy. I need to live my daily life and I won't vote. And that is a, is a catastrophe and a tragedy for democracy. Couldn't agree more. And Mark, you had mentioned Democracy Docket. Uh, just a reminder for those watching right now, if you're not yet signed up for Democracy Docket, it's an amazing resource that I use on a daily basis. So please make sure to sign up. The link is right here on the screen. It's also in the post description of this video. Uh, Republicans have been virtually unilaterally opposed to the restoration of voting rights for felons. Is this going to change that calculus or is their newfound appreciation for voting rights isolated to just their one favorite felon? Well, it's their one favorite felon and the January 6th insurrectionists. Right, right. right. Let us yeah. not forget, they would also like to restore the voting rights and wipe out the convictions. Right. He said he's going to pardon all of the people who stormed the nation's capital uh, and tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. So in fairness to them, it's a somewhat larger group. It's it's the head insurrectionist and then the foot soldier insurrectionist that they feel <laughs> right, this right. way. But no, they don't have any sympathy for anybody else. And that's and, and it is it is it is beyond hypocrisy. Um, it is a it is a dangerous uh, psychopathy that has taken over the Republican Party that they have decided that People who have threatened democracy have tried to undermine free and fair elections. Uh, that that uh, you know a, a guy who you know engaged in election interference in 2016 uh, and has been convicted in New York, uh, at, uh, engaged in uh, post-election election interference in 2020 and is indicted in several jurisdictions. That the foot soldiers that he inspired and directed to go to the nation's capital, who broke windows, beat police officers, uh, uh, and threatened uh, the peaceful transfer of power, that they are the ones who are the victims, and in Donald Trump's words, the hostages, the hostages, uh, he claims they are. Um, uh, and yet everyone else all of the other people part of the criminal justice system, we should have no, we should have no uh, pity on and we should do nothing but mock them. And it is a disgusting tragedy that we face. You know, th there was an effort to reenfranchise felons in Florida through Amendment 4 back in 2018, but that hit some major roadblocks, uh, obviously, at the hands of Republicans. Can you speak on where that process is right now? To say that it hit roadblocks would be uh, would be the most generous interpretation in the world. I mean, like literally, that is that is beyond generous to the Republicans. Yeah, um, I, I think the, it was like an all out an all out assault to the point where I mean, it was just it was just completely non viable by the end of the process. Correct, and it was also and what they did is they created like a Kafka esque star chamber. I mean, essentially, what happened in in Florida is that the people of Florida through the initiative process more than two thirds of them in a red state, by the way, right? This is not like two thirds of the population in New York or California. Two thirds of the population in, uh, in Florida voted on an amendment to allow for the restoration of, 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 um, of rights after someone has served their entire sentence. This was supported by people on the left, people on the right. It had big backers among civic organizations and the business community. And notwithstanding that, what the Republicans did was make a mockery of the people of Florida. They said that it includes not only that they served their sentence, but that they paid all their fines. But then they said they, the state had no obligation to tell people how much money they owed in fines and costs. So literally, people who had served their sentences and said, I'm here with my wallet. How much do I owe? They were the, the state and the counties were refusing to tell uh, those those um, uh, those uh, folks, how much they owed. So they couldn't pay the amount and therefore they couldn't have their rights restored. This, of course, then went up through the conservative uh, Supreme to up to the state Supreme Supreme Court and no meaningful relief was granted. It is an absolute travesty what has happened in the state of Florida. It has made a mockery of the uh, of the ballot initiative process. And it is something that everyone who cares, not just about voting rights, but about strong communities, about giving people a second chance, about decreasing crime by having people reintegrated into society, by by fundamental fairness, by people knowing what it is they need to do to be fully participant participants in the civic process. It is an it is it should offend everyone. Just so I understand here, like 
it, there's been no meaningful relief. So people are still trying to show up to say, I'm ready to pay what I owe. And they're not being told what they owe. And so people are just, that's the end of the line. Like, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, you're understanding it correctly because, because look, again, you know, this is a system that has already in, has already imposed enormous costs on these individuals. And I'm not saying that they didn't deserve it. You know, they committed crimes. They were, they, but they, but they met their, they met their debt to society right. and at, at, you know, oftentimes at great expense and certainly uh, at uh, uh, expense to their liberty and had collateral consequences for jobs and family and all of that. And so then to be faced with this additional insulting obstacle to try to navigate that is essentially impossible to navigate you're, you know, these folks, they're ready to throw their hands up in the air. And I can't, you can't blame them, totally. Brian. I mean, you know, this is a state that has a history of, of treating, uh, uh, of treating people who want to vote not well, <laughs> yeah. unless your name is Donald Trump. Right, right. Well, we'll obviously stay on top of this as soon as we get any update on this uh, in this arena. We'll bring it to you again for those watching right now. If you want to support the work that Mark and his team are doing, please sign up for Democracy Docket. I'll put the link right here on the screen and also in the post description of this video. I'm Brian Teller Cohen. I'm Mark Elias. This is Democracy Watch.